Okay, so um, before I introduce myself, um, a few things to start with. Um, I've been probably put on first because this is probably the least technical talk you're going to get today. Okay, so just setting that expectation there. Um, this is, um, I, I've not studied application security, I'm an engineer, like many people in this room. I, I cut code for a living, that's what I do. I build products, I deliver stuff, um, I make customers happy. Um, application security has kind of winded through that journey quite a few times, but everything that I'm going to present to you today is, I guess, just a view from the trenches. Uh, so, so it's not studying things, but there's a few kind of conclusions that I, or conclusions or current hypotheses that I that I have at the moment that I, I want to share with you, because uh, they're a little bit different than what I held a few years ago. Um, so my name is Sebastian Coles, uh, lead engineer of the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office. Has anyone heard of us? Any hands? A few? Oh, wow. Awesome. Okay, so we do, uh, we're part of the Civil Service, part of the Ministry of Defence. We do a lot of stuff with, with ocean data, that kind of stuff. Um, about 60 engineers. Um, so I lead two teams there, which is which is kind of cool. That's my, my main day job is doing that. Uh, but I also get a certain amount of time each day as the kind of SME for application security. Um, now, as many of you might think that means, is that I'm the guy, if you have a coding uh, challenge that's security related, I'm the guy who will come and sit with you and talk, talk you through it. I might be able to recommend uh, certain coding mitigations that will help you fix that challenge. Or if there's a vulnerability, I might be part of the team that tries to work out just how bad it is. But honestly, that's, that's a really small part of what I do in application security. It's the bit that I love, but it's actually a really small part. Uh, the next kind of bigger section is that I, I, I get very much involved in what we would call threat modeling or risk assessment or whatever you want to call it, just that chat about security, about the risks and upcoming work. So that's a bit of a bigger chunk of what I do. But the, the reality is, the biggest chunk of what I do is I'm a security lobbyist. Um, that, that is what I've become over the last sort of two to three years. It's my job to get engineers to care about security. It's my job to get product owners, product managers, delivery managers to care about it, to budget for it, to, to make sure that we're getting the right people at the table for security conversations. And then the wider bit is that it's my job to then go and talk to senior management and try and get them to care about security. Okay? So certainly to our customers as well. Um, so again, this is going to be quite a soft talk uh, because uh, that, and that's the most powerful thing uh, about security as uh, I can I can give my team as many tools as I want but uh, if I can make them uh, talk about security in the right way to be able to convince people to care about security that that's super powerful. Um, throughout this talk I'm going to give you a couple of anecdotes please feel free to steal them. Okay? <laughs> uh, but I'll be uh, steal them, evolve them, uh, whatever you want to call it um, but they're, they're small stories but they're super powerful just for gaining influence in application security which is super important. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I've kind of cut this talk into three sections. Uh, the first one is about framing application security, that, that kind of challenge. I said I've got some of my current uh, conclusions or hypotheses are maybe a little bit different. And I just want to sell them to you. I want to convince you at the end of this talk to, to kind of see application security my way. Uh, the second part is I'm going to talk about the last sort of two years at UKHO, my role trying to uh, evolve application security. Um, at no point am I ever going to suggest UKHO is bad at security. Um, but there's some things we could do better, and I want to talk about that story. Um, and that last bit is, is four practices. Um, how, sorry, how many engineers do we have in the room? Who, who writes code for a living? Just about everyone? Awesome. So I've got four practices that I think any organization, any team can pick up. Um, they're, they're simple, they're free, they're technology independent, uh, team maturity independent. Um, and what they do is they, they facilitate security conversations, continuous security conversations, because I believe that's key to making secure products. Okay, so first of all, bring in the problem. Uh, so I'm going to make a very bold statement. I know it's very early. Uh, is that a bold statement? Maybe a little bit of a bombshell. Who's got coffee? Put the coffee cups down. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. <laughs> some of you aren't ready to hear this. Some of you are going to rage quit. I'm going to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing I want is someone fainting with a coffee cup. The coffee goes over the guy to your neck. Dying on the coffee shop talk going. It's the end of my career. Okay, so probably buzz it up a bit too much. <laughs> uh, application security for me is a social problem, it's not a technical challenge. Okay, most of the engineers that you work with every day, if you present them with vulnerability, they will know what to do to fix it. Okay, getting them the time to do it, getting them the education to do it, getting them the tools to do it, these are social challenges. This is about convincing people to care about security and, and building up on that influence. Where I just want to sit on the back of the camera. 
Okay, that's not where my conclusion started. Um, usually when I give talks about security, uh, I start with a second boss statement, engineers create vulnerabilities, uh, because we do, they don't come out of nowhere. Uh, they, they don't just get, ooh, that just came out of nowhere. It's, it's not like that, we put them in there. We don't mean to. It's an accident, okay? We're talking about tiny bits of missing validation. So some kind of authorization check that just didn't happen. Really small little things um, that, that happen, but they're, they're just little mistakes. And the reason that that happens, uh, I've originally felt, was these kind of four things. The first one is education. Um, how many here have actually been trained to use the frameworks that they use uh, to, to use all of the security parts of that framework? How many have actually gone through some kind of training to, to use their tools properly? Okay. Yeah, a lot of shaking heads. Yeah, that's fine. Um, some, yeah, so usually this is a point where people start matching on universities. Um, so I think if you've gone through uni, you maybe have a lecture on application security. People don't get much training in this. I'm not going to bash on the universities because it's your risk. Uh, your organisation, you should be training your engineers, that's your risk. Um, but education is a major component of it. The next thing is maybe you've not got access to the right tool. Uh, static analysis tool, or dependency check, or DAS, or, or whatever you use, maybe, maybe you're not using source control properly, or whatever. Uh, <coughs> key vaults, and that kind of thing. So maybe engineers don't have the right tool to build secure products. Maybe that's another part of the problem. Uh, the third one there, uh, and the major one for, for everyone, is, is time. You know, maybe you just need to put delivery pressures, you've got to get the product out the door. There's a whole range of different things you have to think about, especially as a lead engineer. And security, Sometimes it gets shifted a little bit. Maybe it's, we, we don't uh, prioritize it enough because we just don't have enough time. We've got to get it out of the door. Uh, and the last part, uh, and this is my, my first anecdote coming up, um, is about the ever changing landscape. So I usually compare this to the English language. Okay? I've been learning English literally since I've been taught. Okay? I've been learning English uh, for well over 30 years. Um, I've gone through a structured education system all through my life. I've done exams about English. Everything about English, so long, and many people in here have as well. But we all still spell stuff wrong. <laughs> okay, not only that, but we write uh, paragraphs that, that, that don't get taken the right way. They're, they're syntactically correct, but the semantics are all wrong. We've been doing this all our lives. When you talk about security and, and technology in general, the, the languages we, we're using are so infantile. And the, the way that we train people to learn these languages is so <coughs> we still make mistakes there. Um, so when you've got free, your frameworks being updated all the time, new tools, new languages all the time, how can you keep up to date with all the risks? You know, so the ever-changing landscape is another challenge. Um, now these, these next sections of slides, this is very much my, my introspective uh, reflection on UKHO. I'm not about to bash all of your organisation, I'm just bashing my own. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to get to the core of, of what some of the challenges are. Because I mean, if it's a lack of training, I've worked in a few organisations that never not had access to some kind of training, whether it's uh, Linda, I think it's linked where the LinkedIn thing is now, or, or Skillsoft or Coral Sign. I've always had access to training. Uh, the OWASP uh, resources and they're all free on YouTube, and there's a lot of free resources. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure about your own organisations, but at UKHO we have uh, one day a month where we can kind of do whatever we want. Uh, learn a <coughs> framework or something that uh, will contribute to um, development and technologies. Um, but, you know, so I can't, it's not as easy to say it's a lack of trading, it's made, but why are people choosing not to trade in it? Why are they choosing something else? Okay, so it's just trying to get some deeper insight into some of these challenges. And if it's a lack of tooling, well, there's, you know, security, there's a, there's a ton of free tooling out there. Uh, if anyone's been using our stack, it's, it's a great tool. Um, dependency checker, MVD, all these kind of things are all, all free, they're, they're not hard to get into your pipelines. Um, or maybe it's, a, it's a, some kind of budgetary issue, maybe, maybe your organization aren't willing to spend over 50 or hundreds of thousands for check marks or for final. Or, or maybe it's, you, you already have these tools, but IT security has got these tools and they're pushing them. I've seen that a few times as well. Maybe that rollout is particularly poor. You've been given this tool, but you're not trained to use it. You've been told to go use it. One of the other chapters. Maybe you're viewing it as that kind of audit thing. Maybe it's just part of a gate rather than that aid. Um, so maybe it's not. And then time. I mean, but you can't be given more time. More than the same working hours. You know, yeah, maybe you could extend, extend the timeline, but 
I guess so. Well, what we come up with is all these other QA practices. You know, we, some of the teams I work with are always pushing for 100% code coverage and unit testing, but I'll neglect like security. Or as an integration testing or refactoring and also these, all these other things that we are choosing to do, but maybe not choosing security. So is it, is it really time? And then even with the ever-changing te technology, I mean, we still embrace stuff like infrastructure as code, and Terraform, and Ansible, and all these other kind of things, DSC deployments. Um, so we can keep up with kind of the functional aspects of all these new technologies, but we're still not keeping up with the risks. And the, the point of these slides is, is it's maybe just not as clear cut as that. Maybe there's some deeper things that are run through all of this. Uh, and really, a really kind of cheesy conclusion that I really came up with is if you take a team, and I've worked with teams that care about security, regardless of all the other challenges that they're facing, they are going to make a secure product because they care about it. Okay, they, they will find the free tooling, they will make the time, they will create a secure product. Really, to, to get that kind of uh, throughout all of your organizations, you need to find these people. And you need to teach them how to influence other people. And that's how you're going to have an organization that creates secure products. Okay? So that's really how I came to that conclusion. Is application security is it's not just a technical problem. Technical, a little slice, slice of it, but it's really a social problem. Getting people to care about technology, using the right language, making it accessible, and then sharing the influence. Because as engineers, we're, we're sometimes we're not very good at that influence part. Um, and this is usually the part where I start bashing on static analysis tooling, penetration testing, all of these kind of things, which are great if you're doing them. That's great, but that's not the sole answer, and that stuff's not going to solve your, your kind of cultural challenges. Okay. So application security, I think, is a social problem. Have I sold anyone on that? Maybe. Okay, so a bit more interesting. So, all the application security UK. Uh, so about two years ago, I I, I care about security. You're probably going to get that throughout the talk. Um, and I, I care about it for another number of reasons. But one is I feel that like sometimes I see the world in a different way. Uh, I constantly challenge that application security and security in general as a cost. It's this kind of thing that gets in the way of delivery, it's this cost where you have to minimize costs, and it's just this hassle that we have to do. When I see application security, I see something, uh, I see value proposition. I see that could be your unique selling point. I see that could be you investing in future markets. Uh, I think you've probably heard that this anecdote a few times now, we're thinking about the next generation. Drink driving in our current generation is pretty unacceptable. Maybe the last generation, Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a bit of a sport. <laughs> so then, you know, that, that kind of culture is kind of changing with a generation. Uh, and I think it's going to be much the same with, with security. Right now, we, we give away our privacy details quite, quite easily. We don't necessarily care about them too much. But then I think about my daughter. My, my daughter's two at the moment. When she hits 20, one day she's going to turn at me, she's going to look at me and say, perhaps with one, two, three, what on earth is your generation thinking? <laughs> So, and that's, that's how I see the future. It's application security is not just this cost on your business, you're investing in your future markets. These future markets are going to care about security. Get it right now. So, I, I had to spread this message. <laughs> uh, so, the first thing that I had to do is I had to uh, convince my senior management to give me the time, because I, I was working full time as a code, five, five days a week. So, how, how can I make a difference? I need to ask for some time. Um, and anyone can do this, okay? You don't have to be a security expert, you don't have to be accurate to school management some time to make some good changes, okay? Um, and what I did is I, I said, you know, I need a day, I need a day a week. Over the next year, we're going to define the secure lifecycle strategy, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the people that can, and I'm going to build their capability, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to teach them how to write secure code, but I'm also going to teach them soft skills, I'm going to teach them a bit about um, risk language, which I'll come into a little bit. Um, and then we're going to take a look at our full pipeline, not just the SDLC, but a much uh, wider view of the organization to see what kind of quick wins we could find uh, along the way to help improve security. Uh, so that was cut into three parts. That's kind of the formation steps, thinking about how teams are formed. Is there anything we can do there to inject some security? Maybe like right, start and recruit. <laughs> Um, or maybe the delivery, the delivery spec, uh, that, that kind of sprinting that we're going through, what can we do to improve security, and then that kind of production stage when something's happening. Uh, and the last thing was, 
how do we promote this? How do we get our customers to, uh, to know what we're doing? Uh, because it's important, uh, what about the rest of the government? Um, so, I needed a strategy. And all good strategies start with some kind of diagnosis, like what, what's going on? Why can't we spend as much time in security as we want to do? And at the UKHR, it was, it was a real challenge. This might not be the same with your organisations, but um, we have some great branding. Um, and we have some great associations. We're a Ministry of Defence, we're associated with the Navy, we've got some really, we have some really good official branding that our customers trust implicitly. Uh, and, and we have great products. But the challenge that arose with that is our customers weren't asking us for security, they were just assuming it was part of the deal. Um, which might be the case in some of your organisations as well. But that kind of led, led to this kind of thinking, and I've heard this a number of times at UKHO, is our customers don't care about security because they're not asking for it. Like, oh, that's maybe not the true, the true picture. The next challenge was, if I went to speak to any kind of senior management and said, well, what is your confidence in our security of our products? And the confidence was always exceptionally high. And you scratch the surface just a little bit more. What are the, what's the evidence for that? Well, there, there isn't any. Anecdote number two. So when you're buying a car and you... you you want the best for your money, okay? But you somehow, somehow have to assess the quality of this car. You don't just assume that a car is quality until there's evidence to suggest it's not of quality, okay? You're, you're looking for a, a service history or the, you're going to research the vacant model to build up the evidence that that product has quality. And one of the challenges of having hydrograph bonds, and I'm sure it's the same in your organisations, is that when we look at security, it's somehow flipped. We need evidence to prove that something's not secure. That's not really the right way of thinking about it. So part of this challenge is re-educating senior management. You're not supposed to be asking for evidence of security. So if my customers aren't asking for security and the senior management aren't asking for security and you've got devs over here whose confidence is actually quite low in the products that we build, and this by far was the hardest part of my talk. I've, I've been talking to my wife for the last sort of two days trying to sell this to her as well. And this was the hardest thing to... to to try and articulate, and I hope some of you will get it. The problem when it's only engineers asking for something is when it looks like a technical practice. And what I mean by that is it somehow gets being security that ends up on what I would call the negotiation table within a project, which is where you have a whole range of things that engineers would like to use, whether it's test-driven development, whether it's trying to strive for 100% co coverage, whether it's making sure you've got units, uh, your integration testing, you want to end up, you want to refactor, you want to do code reviews, you want to do pair program. And then security is then on that negotiation table. And then you take any kind of any, any PO or project manager with some level of negotiation skills, and suddenly security is another chip on the table that gets bartered away. And it's, it's frustrating to watch. It gets bartered away on you. Well, if you want to address the security bug, why are we spending this time on technical debt? Why not just stop in the technical debt and the security bug? And that's, that's a very frustrating position to be in because I don't believe that that's the right table for some security discussions. And especially when it comes down to the concept of risk owners, it's, it's very challenging because that's really something that should change. Um, one uh, other idea I give, I could, um, we have a, a product, we, this is an UK, just put it out there. Um, but there's a product out there with 50 million revenue stream going through this product. Uh, and there's a CVSS 10 vulnerability on this through the login page of a SQL injection. And you can take out the database, you can destroy the product basically. Okay, there's 50 million of revenue going through this thing every year. A delivery manager does not have, I believe, the authority to, to negotiate that chip away. Okay, they might be the product owner, but there is a level where we're talking about uh, a level of financial risk where that risk ownership has to change. That, that becomes a, a bigger challenge. Maybe that should go to senior management. Maybe if we're talking about tens of millions, maybe that's something that chief executives should be aware of because at the end of the day, they are responsible uh, for, for the broader picture. But when you don't have these discussions up front where you don't have this kind of risk ownership and where the, where the levels are for, for different costs and where you should go to a different person, um, the conversations, the, the POs and the PMs seem to take ownership of all of that. 
And the, I guess the point is of all of these, that the main challenge here isn't about the security practices, it's the conversations between all the different stakeholders and having conversations at the right table with the right people. So that was the main challenge. Oh, and this is challenge number two. And this, this is a little bit separate. I'm sure it happens with your organizations as well. We, we really like to milk IT security. It's very cool. It is cool. I like it. <coughs> There's not ring rates at keyboards breaking into your system. But we, we like to sell this image. <laughs> now, the challenge has, and you've probably all heard the term psychological safety by now. It's, it's something about um, we're, we're just in meetings every day and we, we want to provide our opinions, but we're constantly navigating the social context of what we're working at. Are we going to sound silly? So stupid. Maybe I shouldn't provide my idea to the table. That's hard on a normal day, okay? Just in a meeting room, talking about the, anything, the delivery of a project. But suddenly when you put IT security on the table and there's ring rates everywhere, psychological safety becomes even harder. And I'm sure it's happened to your teams as well, where security comes up and people get very, very quiet. Engineers get very, very quiet. And some of that is because they feel they don't know enough about application security as they should. And they, they don't want to expose that fact to the rest of the group. Okay, that's a big challenge. And what generally happens is you get one person who's done a little bit of IT security or application security, uh, and they start to run the show. Which is, um, I mean, it's, it's their game. They're the engine on the team that cares about security. It's their thing. Let's, let's do that. That's, that's not the kind of culture that I need to build in the KHO. It needs to be somewhere where it can be safe to talk about security so everyone can bring their skills up. And that it was okay to say, I don't know what cross site scripting is. Can somebody help me? That's how you're going to build teams that build secure products. <coughs> so this, this frustrates me. And this happens as well with stakeholders, um, senior management. I start talking about IT security, alarm bells start going off yeah, because of this uh, image that we have. Oh. So, my, my overarching policy coming into trying to make the security better in PHO is all about language. I had to make it safe, I had to make it accessible, whether I was talking to engineers or PEOs or stakeholders. It had to just become another risk, like every other risk that they deal with, whether it's a marketing campaign or any other kind of risks. I then had to find as many stakeholders as I could and convince them that uh, to care about application security so I could uh, put more pressure on product owners, product managers. But the main guiding policy was delivery really has to come first. I couldn't get in the way of delivery because that, that's, that's when the challenges come. You know, I had to start small. It had to be about continuous improvements over sprints as long as I wasn't getting in the way of the <coughs> And my key actions coming out, which I'll talk about in a second, that find as many people as I could, senior people. I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I had to organize, coordinate, and train people who care about security. So I'll start talking about our security champions initiative, the, the hackathons where we ran at UKHO, the conferences that we went to, and all that kind of thing, the training that I gave them. I had to identify all the roles and responsibility in application security. It was a, a very gray area at UKHO. We had an IT security function, but they didn't feel necessarily responsible for the way that products were built. That was a, an engineering challenge. And there was this little bit of gray area in here about who, who owns what. And then it was about trying to seek a breadth of quick wins. It's not necessarily just within the software development life cycle. Okay. So finding stakeholders. So I'm going to come on to these next few anecdotes now. And these, these are uh, four different stories that I tell about security, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I needed to, to get people on board, to get people on side with what I wanted to do, I had to have a vision. I had to have some kind of message that I wanted to get across. And I wanted UKHO to be recognised within the MOD uh, and the civil service as leaders in application security. That's, that's a really good message, it's a nice message, it's, um, it's inspiring. Okay? It, it, was, it was enough to get people on side. This is what I'm trying to do. If you're going to try and change application security in your own, um, your own organisations, try, try and find that vision statement. That's going to help you a lot. And I had to convince them why. And some of it was around if I was talking with engineers, we wanted to increase our confidence in how to build secure products. So confidence was pretty low. I wanted to maintain our reputation. So UKHO, one of the main challenges we're facing at the moment is for hundreds of years, we've been taking ocean data and we've been making paper charts. That market is declining. It's 
declining very rapidly for us. So we're moving more into to data. So instead of giving you paper charts, we want you to be able to just get the raw data and make your own products on the end of it. Um, obviously, one of the challenges there, we're moving from something a bit safer, paper, into data. So security, and not only that, but we take data from all over the world from other organisations. So UKHO, we're responsible for the, the kind of the UK area, but we take data from, from Japan, we take data from, the, from America, we take data from all these other places. And we, we have to apply, we have, they need to trust us with that data. So maintaining our reputation was key to that kind of where we were trying to go in the future. Okay. So as senior management, that was quite a good story to start telling. Third one about value proposition, I've mentioned this already. When I see security, I see investing in future markets. I see a unique selling point. Um, and this was really captured in the best way when I had a chat with, uh, chat with our head of R&D. Uh, we were talking about, um, so he goes out and customers and trying to work out new products. And I said, so when, when does security got into the conversation? And his response to me was, never, unless we mention it, and that's all the conversation becomes about is security. And that's it, that's, that's value proposition. I mean, if, you, if I'm able to communicate to these stakeholders what the engineering teams are doing, all this different uh, training we're investing in, we're at all these different tooling that we're investing in, and then the R&D are able to communicate that to our clients. That's how we get more buy-in for security. That's how we get more time. So that's, that's great. Value proposition. It's not all just about cost and scary things. It's about more money, which some people like. Um, and lastly, and this, I guess, this is, for me, this is the reason that I'm on the stage, the reason that I try and promote security at home, is because I guess on, online can be quite a, a scary place. Um, and if someone steals your, your details through a product that we built, I, I would feel more surprised. I feel that we have a duty of care with these things. We have a duty of care to build products that look after people's data. Because I don't want someone getting a loan out in, in their name. I don't want them to have to suffer identity fraud. Okay, <coughs> one of the other stories that I now tell is about, say you were borrowing your friend's car. Okay, it's a physical asset, and you put a dent in it, okay? Just a, just a little dent. How gutted are you going to feel about that when you have to tell your friend that you've got a little dent in their car? Okay. But your friend, that's not going to stop them walking the street. Okay. It's not going to, they're, they're going to see it, might be frustrated for a little bit, but then they'll go get fixed, put it in the garage, whatever. It's not going to make them lose sleep. If you take someone who has their, their address stolen and enough details to take out a credit card, that person now is they're, they're going to be just a financial loss and using using bank account and money and whatever. But it's, it's more like that kind of emotional and social impact. You've had a random stranger somewhere in the world who's now targeting you. It's taking out your money. Is attacking you. That's a scary place to be in, and that's going to stop you going out the street. That's going to make you wonder about the people that you're talking to. And for me, this is why I want to do this. This is why I try and build secure products because I care about these people. And again, this, that is another story, the arsenal awesome stories that you should have if you care about security in that one. And just to really emphasize the point, I'm not expecting you to read all of that, but a large part of what I was doing is just meeting stakeholders. Chief executives, chief operating officers, chief customer, head of R&D, head of marketing, head of sales. Security is, is this kind of great conversation starter in a way that's very horizontal. Uh, it's, it's very good for starting conversations on the departments because security is something that all teams somehow get involved in in some way, you know, even if it's just a password for logging into your computer. Security is a great way to network internally, and what I needed to do was just find as many fans as I could. At UKHO, we're very scrum based, uh, we follow scrum to the team, um, and that's how I did this project as well as I would have scrum reviews. So every, every two weeks, I would have people in the room tell them about what I did. But I needed powerful people with that room. And taking the time to do some internal networking, having someone, having the head of sales come to my sprint review was unheard of at UKHO. Why on earth would they be there a software engineer sprint review? But he got it. Value proposition. Money, money, money. Okay, that's why the head of sales was there. Okay. But it's, it's, we're doing this for the right reasons. Okay, It's okay to have a little bit of social influence for the right reasons. Okay? And I think this is the right reason. Next anecdote story, 
Um, this is me trying to convince to um, re-educate stakeholders, okay, re-educate management. Uh, one of the stories I like to tell is about building houses. Uh, this is me trying to tell them why it's so hard to build secure products. Oldest house in the UK discovered, sorry, in Britain, over 11,000 years ago. Okay, that's quite a long time. Actually, we can ask this as a quiz to the audience. When do you think the first ever building regulations came in for building the property? Anyone want to hazard a guess? I reckon it's after the first building collapsed and killed people. I think way, way more than that. Like way closer than that. It's 1965. We've been building houses for 11,000 years, and the first time someone thought we should get some government kind of regulation on how we did that, yeah, no, that's, that's ridiculous. So one of the stories that I like to tell stakeholders is, we can't wait for the government, okay? We can't wait for regulation. We have to take this into our own hands if we're gonna build a product. The other story that I like to tell them is about what, how I view penetration testing. Imagine you just built this house, and you take a big hammer, and you just try and hammer away at that building, okay? You hammer the doors, oh, okay, that's a bit of weakness here. Hammer back, okay? That is kind of how most organizations approach software assurance. You build a product, you get the camera at the end of it, and it's not particularly efficient. That's not how we build houses. Maybe we should take some inspiration from the regulations. Um, anyone here read anything about um, eSIM or OpenSAM? Has anyone read about these things? No, they're, they're worth looking at. Uh, so BSIM is the Build Security in Maturity Model, B-S-I-M-M, -M. and OpenSAM is an OWASP thing. Um, the, two, the two free resources, um, and they're about how to try and get more security into organizations, into product development, totally worth a look. Uh, the next bit that I'm about to explain is what they would call building a satellite, because uh, the reality is I, I can't, you, you can't do this on your own. Okay, if you're going to be the security evangelist in your organization, you have to start things, make it start, find the right people that you need to keep going. So the next thing is, well, how can I build a satellite, a group of people that care about what I was doing? And I set up a few different, um, a few different groups. The most successful by far was security champions. Uh, originally, this was kind of, so we have about 60 engineers sending out an email saying, Hey, I want to start this kind of security club. It's a bit like a guild. Um, we're going to meet up once a month. We're going to talk about security. We'll do some hacking things. It'll be cool. I'll bring some cake. Please come. Um, so I, I had a good response. I had about 20 engineers who were, who were actually interested in it. It was enough for every team. Uh, and that was kind of the start of the satellite. So I try and create fans, people, empower them. I, I taught them about basic penetration testing. Um, we did some .NET and some Spring kind of uh, code, code stuff. Um, but uh, I also started trying to teach some more about uh, what I'm doing here, about influencing people, uh, about negotiation. I also taught them uh, a bit about kind of finance, being able to talk about things in money terms as well. They didn't enjoy that. Um, but uh, it's, that, that was the kind of group that I was building up, and that became uh, quite a powerful force at UKHO. And it wasn't just engineers, it started as engineers, but then I started getting Oh, you're a sysadmin who cares about security. Maybe, maybe you should come to our club as well. Um, and just kind of uh, just just spreading it, just trying to get influence more people that care about security. Um, and the, the kind of best validation I got of this club was uh, about a year later, one of the other lead engineers uh, was was talking about some security challenge in their product. Um, and basically, the, the security champions in that team were able to convince the delivery manager to, to address the security challenge. And that's exactly what this kind of thing was about. Framework custodians, that one didn't work out quite so well. So that's when I tried to get a nominated person to care about a different language. Um, so you were the .NET framework custodian, you were the Python framework custodian, the JavaScript framework custodian. Kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Get someone kind of responsible to curate the information. They give it a try in your organizations. I, th I found that quite challenging. That didn't work out so well. People just wanted to get together and cake instead, um, which is fine. <laughs> and with these guys, um, it, was, it wasn't just about trying to train them with my own training. We got stuff like um, Case. Uh, if you've got any .NET Java engineers, I would recommend having a look at, uh, some of you have probably heard of EC Council and their Certified Ethical Hacker Program, um, some certification stuff. They also do programming ones. Uh, the case.net came out last year. I thought it was pretty good. 
uh, an actual something for developers. This isn't a pen testing thing. This is as an engineer learning how to use your framework properly. Um, and prices are pretty good. I say pretty good for, for a business, they're pretty good. Um, and they're just trying to get people. <clears throat> I can't remember what that signal meant. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I got people out to uh, different conferences as well. So the Open Security Summit, Cyber UK. The bigger piece of work that I did was going around all the different practices. So we have a product owner practice, we have business analysis practices, various practices. Um, what I wanted to do was get them to um, tell me what they thought their responsibilities were for application security. Uh, at the back of last year, I had um, a big kind of divisional meeting with about 200 people there. And I got the various managers on stage to present to the rest of the division what their responsibilities were for security and how they went and addressed them. Um, that was kind of one of the highlights that, that was really good for the marketing security. Um, I don't expect you to read this, but this is the kind of slides software engineering practice, software engineering manager on the stage. This is what we're responsible for, this is how we deal with it. The last thing is about breadth of opportunity. So, so I really try to just do a whole breadth of things and experiment, see what works. Um, one of the easiest things to do, which um, had, had a meaningful impact, was about security and recruitment. It was a great example to go and speak to people, a uh, great reason to go and speak to HR about security. It's like, how is part of the interview process? Do you do, you, do you security? Do you ask a security question? Something like that. It's like, well, well, no, okay, let me help you. Here are some security questions you can ask for various roles. Uh, these are the expected responses. That was a super quick win. There's tons of stuff. Future pen testing. Uh, citizen developers, again, we, we have, have a core engineering body, but we also have lots of people who pick up code, whether they're geo-analysts or whether they're star, uh, star science people. Um, so going out to meet all these people to talk about security, again, was a great way of expanding other things. Um, and the last one there is about the security slide. So I, I make the delivery manager somewhat of a bad guy in some of this. And I really needed them to have something that they could be proud of to say, oh, I've given the team um, this time to do security. How, how can they then sell that to the rest of their practice and their management? And I came up with this security plan that they could come up with. Looks pretty cool, right? <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, and this was a way about telling the security story for a sprint. So we, we uh, threat model these stories. There's a few more inputs coming in here. So we've increased the attacks like this. And this is the coding preventions we did, the security test. It just looks cool. Um, so I recommend something like, like that. And this is a good way to get yeah, our stay focused. Okay. Just because I've got a few more minutes left. <clears throat> I can I can't begin to explain how important risk language is. Uh, as engineers, we don't really get taught this. It's something we I guess we just adapt as we get more senior. Um, but risk lingo is, is so uh, important for trying to convince stakeholders. And what I do is um, every uh, six months, I get three hours with, with engineers and I, I get to teach them a bunch of things. And this is like the first thing I try and teach people is how to use the right language. Going up to a delivery manager or a senior state manager saying there's a SQL injection in Blanc is not very helpful. Getting them to say there's a particular answer that's worth X amount of pounds and that there's a vulnerability in it, there's this threat, there's, and if that threat matures, there's this impact. It's good, right? It's good language, it's, it's a, but it's business language, okay? So this is, getting engineers to talk in this way is super helpful, getting them to actually understand and provide options to their stakeholder. We can transfer this, okay? We can maybe buy this other product and do it a different way and transfer that risk to some insurance or whatever. Or we can try and mitigate it because you as the risk owner, you have to do something, okay? You could choose to accept it. I'm trying to, again, just that language, forcing the risk owner to take a decision out of 10, we'll try and mitigate it. Yeah, that's what you want. And for those, just to, to bang it on the in the head, I, I love teaching these words to engineers. Um, if you can actually start articulating asset value or the exposure factor, and that's when we start talking about C, the CVSS scoring mechanism. If you get some time, really look at CVSS, a uh, common vulnerability scoring uh, scheme. Um, as a way of trying to articulate the probability and the damage of the vulnerability, uh, most as I've here at CVSS, it goes from zero to ten. Okay, good. Have a read of it because the, the actual scoring components are very good for conversations with stakeholders. 
If you're actually able to say, and someone turns around, what's the probability of that happening? And you go, well, it's a remote system. They don't need any kind of authorization to be able to pull off this vulnerability. They don't need to track another user into so you're doing anything, and that's what increases the risk, and then it affects the, the confidentiality integrity of, uh, of this asset. These are good conversations to have in articulating the risk. Yeah, actually, yeah, leave a little time for questions. You've got help with this. Help with this. We're, we're nearly there. Okay. Team onboarding. Again, so easy. Okay, when you have a new start joining your team, go and sit with them. Your lead engineer, go and sit for 30 minutes to talk about application security. Okay. What I do for, for every new start on my team is we'll just talk about the overall soft tank. Just route through SQL injection, cross-site scripting, have you heard of them? And it's got to be safe. Okay. It's got to be, it's okay for you to say no, because all that's going to happen is I'm going to say, oh, can you go and look at these links? Can you go and read this stuff? But the message here is this team cares about application security. Please go and read some stuff on it. That takes 30 minutes, and the amount of security conversations I've had with those individuals in the coming days, weeks, and months has totally made that worth it, as opposed to, say, a static analysis tool, £100,000 for check marks. I don't get security conversations out of that. 30 minutes on boarding, I get conversations out of it. That's good. Let's get the SCLC. Um, my view on the kind of traditional security effort, so as we get ramped up to release, when we have ARBs and security tests and pen testing, that's kind of traditional, but the reality is we can go way more left than this, okay? Uh, another argument, that, discussion that I have with the senior management, going left doesn't stop at requirements. Going left goes way further than that. It's with training, it's with security development policy, it's with even at the interview stage, we can start investing in application security. And understanding that we are part something much bigger than technology okay we are part of something bigger than the value creation section of our organization so there's so many more people to talk to and big fans of security the very last thing i want to talk about is development threat modeling so this is probably the, the key every one of our engineering teams that will do this so we, we follow sprint quite religiously um develop threat modeling heavily based off scrum but it's really about taking each PBI or story and having a chat about what could go wrong. Uh, most people would call these the abuse cases. And we get all the engineers to do that, and that gets recorded in the acceptance criteria of stories. So we talk about what could go wrong, we talk about specific coding mitigations to address it, and then we come up with testing criteria to, to meet it. And every story gets this. It's usually facilitated by one of the security champions of the team. Um, I got to present at Cyber UK earlier this year. It's, it's so easy. Um, and to make it really quick, what you can do is we start with should we questions. These are the questions that we ask a story as to whether we're going to have this threat on the future. Yeah. If you want to chat about developing threat model, come and see me. It's a great practice for your teams. It's super light. It only takes 30 minutes in a two week sprint. Uh, it gets faster with time. But what I really stress is like, when it comes to having security conversations, I don't like tools. I don't like tooling. I don't like having people sitting in front of security uh, Microsoft threat modeling tool. It's quite dull. Okay? This is all about conversations. I also don't enjoy novelty. No Lego, please. I've had enough of Lego. We're adults now. Okay? Um, no gimmicks, we have, have these things going through gimmicks, and the last one is don't repeat yourself. <laughs> I just, in summary, application security is a social challenge. And the real message, I'm hoping that somebody here has touched a little bit. You don't have to be an elite hacker in your organization to make a difference with security. You just have to be an evangelist, someone who cares. Go and find other people that care. Okay, that's it. That's it.